Hey, here we go. All right. Come on, guys, let's keep those applause going. Be legend. Oh. All right, guys, we got legends. Bill Farmer, Alan Oppenheimer here. We'll give them a moment to get settled in. Oh. Thanks, thanks for coming. One more time with the applause, let's go. Now I was telling the crowd here, I want to take a few minutes to talk to you guys. I'm a nobody, but I'm here to ask you some questions <laughs> uh, and get you talking. And then we're going to take some questions from the audience. Sure. i got to start off by saying I'm a huge fan of E-Man and Motu. So representing today, Mr. Oppenheimer. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody got a fur coat? I can <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I had to cheat a little bit. You guys have okay. quite a career of voice acting and, and in person. It's We're all lies. lies. It, really? IMDb yeah. has no authentic information about it. No, you. that's how I have to go figure what I did. I forgot. <laughs> you know, people always say, you know, well, you did this part too. Wait a minute. I don't even know where my wallet is. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, let's see. Mr. Farmer, we have you down. Uh, I have you down for voices of Goofy, Pluto. Of course, you know who Goofy is. <laughs> yeah, that's a long time. Yeah. Since the 60s? Uh, no, no, I, I started 87, so 35 years. I've been doing. Wow. That's impressive. Uh, Pluto. Pluto. Woo! I can do that in all languages. <laughs> uh, Mighty Mouse. Uh, not Mighty Mouse. I was on Mighty Mouse. Okay. Mighty Mighty Mouse. Yeah, so there you go. that was one of my first uh, first series that I did way back then. <laughs> I love that response. Uh, Astro Boy? I did. I worked on Astro Boy. Uh, Boy. Uh, a lot of different characters and monsters and things. Uh, uh, Detective Tawashi was my main character okay. on that, which is uh, Japanese for brush because his nose looks like a shoe brush. Oh, that's a cool little behind the scenes. Uh, and several characters in uh, Space Jam. Oh, yeah. If you know uh, Sylvester, Yosemite Sam, Foghorn Leghorn, and the Bugs and Daffy, and Robot Chicken, and some other stuff. Thanks to Mel Blanc, who uh, was, I think, everybody's idol in the early days. And uh, I got to meet him once, a long time ago. Uh, I think we were doing uh, Roger Rabbit. Oh, and uh, he was, as I remember, he came to, and he had the emphysema, he was a smoker. And he would smoke, and he had an oxygen tank, so we were worried he was exploding, you know, or something. <laughs> Always leaning away just a little bit in case. Yeah? Yeah. And then we've got uh, Alan Oppenheimer, which of course I mentioned Skeletor, that you voice. Yeah. Quite a few other characters on Masters of the Universe. Yes, I did. Yeah. You were talking about Mel Blanc. Uh, yeah. Well, I was walking down the hall. We were doing uh, the Smurfs, and we took a break, and I was walking down the hall with Mel, and uh, uh, some Japanese animators were visiting the studio, and so uh, Joe Barbera introduced us. He said, this is Alan Oppenheimer, and Mel Blank in the room. And so uh, Joe said, uh, Mel, uh, why don't you say something? And he went, eh, what's up, Doc? Ooh, but bunny, but bunny. <laughs> Uh, got you down for Filmation's Ghostbusters. Yeah. Yeah. The Smurfs you mentioned. Yeah, I started with uh, E-Man, and then I spread out all over Filmation. Yeah. <laughs> they had a few I problems. don't even remember what I did. It's like you. Yeah. I look at the IMDB and I say, I didn't know. I, I did that. <laughs> don't ask me to do that. I don't know what I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of my favorite movies as a kid, The Never Ending Story. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Foul Four. Falcor and the Rock Fighter and the Mork and the Narrator. Four. The price of one. <laughs> so I was on the way out the door after doing Falcor and Wolf Guy said, Oh, let me ask, could you do this character? 
Oh, I'm not quite. I said, well, let me look at it. Well, I, I knew exactly. So I just started in here, you know. Oh, yeah. A little taste of quartz. Mm. <laughs> I identified with a rock fighter right away. I think I must have had a couple of meals that tasted like rocks or something. <laughs> anyway, and then Gabor, and I did that, and then, no, I've done three, and so goodbye, go, oh, could you just do the narrator at the end? Which was very interesting, because it was my own voice, but the last line was, but oh, that's another story. Oh. That, was, that was a cool moment just then. I remember hearing that time and time again as a kid. And to hear it in person, wow, come on. Uh, and the final one I have you now, another one of my favorites, the Transformers. Did some voices on Transformers? Well, I kind of remember those. I stole them for myself, you know. Because <laughs> uh, uh, Sea Spray is a ripoff of Merman, but you can plagiarize yourself. You can't sue yourself with the help. <laughs> and then, uh, oh, I know that I did Warpath. I, I just finished doing a movie with George C. Scott, so I just took his voice and put it on Warpath. <laughs> and, uh, oh, the beachcomber, well, that's just, he's just kind of mean, he's kind of cool. Everything's uh, okay. <laughs> I, I love watching you guys. You can, you can see the transition when you get into your character for a second. Is there, a, is there a way you approach when you're doing a new voice and how you get into character? Well, if you're doing a new voice, you've got to create it, first of all, so you've got to look at that, unless you're doing a voice match. Goofy was obviously been around since 1932, so I just had to do my best Goofy to get that one. But uh, if you're doing a new character, um, there was, uh, we did a film called Prince and the Popper. Uh, it was one of the first ones that I did as uh, Goofy and first theatrical Goofy and Pluto, and uh, they had Horace Horsecollar, who really didn't have a voice before. And I asked, I, they said, can, let's come up with a voice on the spot. And they said, well, what's he like? And they said, well, he's kind of snooty and kind of, uh, you know, uh, upper class. So I was thinking Jim Beck or something of Gilligan's Island. <laughs> and, uh, and then they said, but he's very droll, like uh, you know, Ben Stein from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Bueller, Bueller. So I took uh, Jim Baggis and I just kind of slowed him down and added a little bit of uh, Ben Stein and there you go. And so sometimes it's just a mixture of a couple other characters. That's awesome. How about you, Mr. Oppenheimer? Is there a way you approach your characters as you go into them? After I've given up stealing from somebody else. <laughs> There's a lot of that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I look at the cell, the drawing. And I always get it from there, like with Skeletor, I saw that he had a bony head. I'm sorry, give you equal time over here. Uh, uh, a bony head, so that's why I made him nasal. And yeah, and then I just, it just came out an octave or two higher, you know? <laughs> the laugh was an accident during the first or second episode. I was probably covering an embarrassing moment and put in <laughs> Lou Scheimer said, you leave that in, that's your signature and we're right for it. So that's what he did, he wrote a lot of stuff, you know, laugh here, laugh there. Then one day he said, and halfway through the second year, we'd already done about 80 episodes, he said, to, you know, we're running out of insults, make up some insults and just ad lib them. So I ad libbed about 20 insults. And 19 of them were still on the floor at Filmation. <laughs> oh, no, they were really schmutzy. Schmutzy. Smutty, darling, smutty. <laughs> and maybe we stole one of them from that show. But I, I, I just love, I love the characters. I love working at Filmation. Lou Scheimer was just the best. Very supportive. One day he was wearing a ring, and I said, is that from a university? He said, yeah, I went to Carnegie Tech. I said, so do I, so did I. We were there at the same time. He was a painting and design major on the second floor, and I was a dramat on the first floor. We never met. The closest was that we dated the same girl at different times. <laughs> <laughs> that could have got dicey. Yeah, she, <laughs> she was an all around kid, wonderful. <laughs> Oh, you picked up on that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we, 
better move on to another topic. Uh, how about uh, origin stories? How is it that you got into voice acting? Uh, did you have a passion for it early on, or is oh, it I grew up, up with the radio? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I did radio as well for a number yeah. of years. My degree was in broadcast journalism. Yeah. I kicked around in radio for a number of years, and uh, then got into stand-up comedy in the early '80s, and did that for about five years out of Dallas. And uh, which I thought was the best training ever because you know it gets you over stage fright and stuff, and it's it's kind of intimidating when you go in for a voiceover audition. And you know they're behind this glass in the control room, and you're thinking you see them going, and I'm thinking, well, they can get Frank. Let's get Frank Welker. This guy sucks, you know. <laughs> but they're really saying, no, no, I want a ranch dressing on that, you know. So <laughs> you never know, but you have to just kind of put that aside to let the character come in. And that uh, stand-up, if you can do that, I've had so many bad shows doing that, you know, kind of makes you immune to uh, what the people think. So you to entertain yourself, basically. And once you entertain yourself, you'll entertain the audience. And that was uh, probably the best advice I got. I took classes when I first came out to Hollywood from Dawes Butler. And Dawes was one of the, sometimes a lot of people don't know who he is, but he was a consummate professional and such a great guy. And as he did like Captain Crunch, Huckleberry Hound, Yogi Bear, all the Hanna-Barbera voices and stuff. And uh, his real voice was kind of like Captain Crunch. And a friend of mine said, you should take classes from Dawes Butler. And I said, the Dawes Butler? And so I got a number and I called him up and he goes, this kind of had this, oh, hi, Bill. Oh, why don't you come over to the house on Wednesday? And we'll kind of kick around some stuff. And, uh, and it was like $10, and if you didn't have the money, no problem. And he was just the most generous guy, and he was the first one that said, really, the most important thing, acting. It's not voice acting, it's voice acting. Acting is premier. Let the voice follow the acting, and be a good actor first, and the rest can come. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of people that do, you know, uh, good impressions and copies and stuff like that, but can they maintain it for a four-hour session and make it new and make it jump off the page? So that was the best advice I ever got, was just to learn to be a good actor. I was going to ask about that. Before you guys came on, we were asking the audience, and several said that they wanted to get into voice acting. Yeah. Aside from that advice, or Mr. Oppenheimer, do you have any, how would somebody get into voice acting? What do they need to do? Don't. <laughs> to do it, you guys got to follow your dream, but what Bill said is right, it's not about voice, it's about acting. You know, there's a lot of movie stars and all who try to do this, and they never can do it because they have to rely on the camera and the long pauses and all that, and it's not that. It's, it's like good actors can... The, the, the voice follows you, what the script tells you. In and the relationships with the other actors. And if you listen and answer, listen and answer. Because really good acting is listening a lot. And uh, that's what improv is about, is yeah, yeah. And pick up on that and go. Are you all familiar with Nichols and May, the great improvisers? Yeah, I mean, they were the best of best, and they worked off of each other. Well, they finally they incorporated what was best for their final shows, but they were great actors. And of course, Elaine May is a brilliant writer too. But it's, as Bill said, it's just plain damn good acting, that's all. And you can create a voice, but if you believe it, which is what an actor has to do, if you believe it, it transmits. I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> great. take over on some of the questions now. I know you guys have some uh, questions for our panelists here, so if anybody has a question, please raise your hand up, and if I call on you, be loud so we can hear you up here. Uh, sir? Quick, quick, boring one. Have you done any industrial voice acting? Oh, yeah, over the years. Yeah, not a whole lot. Um, trying to remember what I did. It's like I have to look it up on IMDb to see if I... Oh, I did that. Okay. We were talking about that earlier. It, I don't remember what I've done. I've done a lot of uh, narration in, uh, you know, technical things like, you know. Uh, I, I've done phone trees. You press one. From, yeah, I, I've done those type of things. 
like the menu system you yeah. get when you call yeah. in somewhere. I've done that. Yeah, you know, I think the hardest session I've ever, people always ask what the hardest session you've done. It was a goofy, I did early on in technology a talking watch. And I actually had to go up to San Francisco to get in a booth and go, the time is 12.01 a.m. The time is 12.02 a.m. You know, about by 3.30 I was going nuts. You know. <laughs> hell gigs like that, but uh, hey, they're paying me, okay, you know, but uh, most of them are a lot more fun than that, and industrial stuff, but uh, um, yeah, about everything voiceover, at least uh, one or two times. Who else is headed to eBay to find that watch later? <laughs> uh, how about you, sir, in the leather jacket? I met him a couple of times, but I didn't really know him. Uh, he was more of a Vegas style, so I met Vegas a couple of times a long time ago. And uh, but I certainly got a lot of my impressions by watching how he did it. It's easier. Oh, that's the hook. Okay, that's what you go for on the voice. And uh, so you can learn impressions by watching an impressionist. <laughs> Very inceptioning. Uh, any other questions? How about you, sir? Yeah, um, I got a question for Bill. Um, what inspired you to do a uh, Hop Hop's voice? A what inspired Hop Hop's voice from yeah. Amphibia? By the way, this is the, if you, any of you have seen Amphibia, today is the anniversary, third anniversary of the premiere. So I just saw that. Yeah. Uh, that's what I am. Uh, actually, a lot of it, a lot of voices that you come up with, you look at the picture, and you just kind of figure, what would this guy look? He looked at his physical characteristics. He's short, stumpy. I thought he might have a higher voice. And first, he had a little ascot on and a little vest. So I was kind of thinking a, a southern gentleman kind of a thing. But then I figured, for some reason, it went more, and it's basically my Ross Perot impression. <laughs> and, and because he's kind of wacky, and, and it's more of a West Texas kind of a voice, and that one kind of stuck, you know? <laughs> That's, and you sometimes just, yeah, that's the voice. And it then sounds the like Jack says, Benny out of Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Rochester. <you> know. <laughs> I see, back in the very back, you've been patient on the stand, sir. What's the character you wish you could have voiced? Character you wish Skeletor. No, I <laughs> And he goes, oh, he's a lot better looking than you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about you in the uh, gray hat, sir? You had your hand up, maroon hoodie? Yes, yeah. Um, in a uh, goofy Yeah, the uh, question was in the Goofy movie, did we do the, I do the singing? Yes, I did. And that was actually kind of interesting in that movie. It was day number one. We did the voices, and, uh, the, the singing. And uh, Jason Larson did not do the, uh, uh, did do Max's voice singing, although he can sing. I, they didn't know he could sing. And so he got kind of shafted out of that job, which uh, I've done on stage with him at like the D23 convention. We had a Goofy movie panel. And he did sing the open road with me live and uh so he can totally sing and he should have been able to 
uh, do that in a movie. But yeah, uh, and how do you do it? I mean, you just got to try, and you don't expect Goofy to be able to sing well, so. <laughs> yeah, 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 so. All right, about it over here, second row, white. Clubhouse. What about it? How was your time? Your time on Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Oh, well, that, uh, that's actually one of the longer running. That came out in 2006, and uh, I had no idea that it would still be this popular, but those kind of shows have a new audience every couple of years when kids get old enough to find Mickey and Donald and Goofy and stuff like that, and uh, hey, it's still paying residuals, so I love it. <laughs> <laughs> You're reminded every time you yeah, catch the yeah. check. All right. Thank God for Mickey Mouse Club. <laughs> uh, how about here in the third row? Who's your favorite Looney Tune and why? My favorite Looney Tune is the one I've, I've done, but it, even without that, of course, when I, I, I've done like Bugs and Daffy on an episode of Robot Chicken, and which was fun. And Bugs had a great attitude. No, oh, brother, ain't I a sticker? You know, and uh, but bong oh, one leg on to my favorite. I know it's about as sharp as a bowling ball. He had some of the best lines ever. And uh, that was, uh, yeah, he was my, he's my favorite Looney Tunes. It's a planet Mars. <laughs> it is. It was Kenny a, Del Mars. Yeah, it came from an earlier thing that Mel was doing, an impression of an earlier guy who did Senator Claghorn on radio back in the old days. Yeah. And so everything's ripped off from something <laughs> earlier. <laughs> Just got to tweak it a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's all you got to do. How about uh, Sir in the Blue Hoodie here? Uh, for Alan, what was your take on Mark Hamill's version of Skeletor? Oh, what is the next question? <laughs> well, we're moving on. All right. How about you uh, in the gray shirt there? showed me the picture of himself, and I immediately identified with that, because he's, you know, a sweet character. And I just, I read it like I, like I did, you know, kind of like, oh, leaving so soon. Anyway, I, he hired me, and I went to Munich to record it. And we did it the first day, and he said, well, that was fine, thank you. I said, can I have a playback? And he said, and I looked at the playback and I said, I have to do it again. So, Will it be come back tomorrow? So I came back the second day and I re-recorded. Now the difference, and that's interesting, what you see in the movie is the second day, because that had feeling. The first day was technically correct, but who cares? And so I recognized that Falcor had heart, and that's what you see and that's why it works. Thank you. That's really cool. I love that. Yeah. I'm gonna so I'm gonna I'm gonna eBay a goofy watch and rewatch never ending story. <laughs> <laughs> you sir in the black hat. I, well first, I grew up loving six million dollar man. If there was one actor I got to meet, guess who? I don't know. <laughs> Yourself, sir. Oh, well, thank you. I, You're the first person who ever complimented me on that role. <laughs> no, no, it just fascinated me. Thank it's you. Just, it really just fascinated me more than anybody else on that show. Thank you. It was thoughtful. I may, I may tell you a, an anecdote. I was doing one episode of that, and Virgil Vogel was the director, and he was a great director from the old days of westerns and all of that. So we were rehearsing, and I was, I was really rehearsing. He said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm, I'm trying to make sense out of this. He said, it's exposition. It's bullshit. Just get through it. <laughs> I was shocked. By the way, that's the best I ever did it after he gave me that direction. And I'm not kidding you. It just go through it. It's just facts. Stop trying to make something of it. I really love uh, 
Rob Paulson's Talking Tunes, and I especially enjoy your episode where he had you reading from The Godfather. Oh, yeah. Now, folks, if I tell you that he did, I'll make him an offer he can't you in goofy voice. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine it, but it won't hold a candle to actually hearing it. <laughs> Oh my gosh, yeah, that, well, Rob, I've certainly known since the very beginning. Uh, I did a, episode, a series called Goof Troop, which was my first series back in the early 90s, which was uh, a, a dream cast. I, and I was the lead, and it was my first series. I was scared, totally. And we never got the script ahead of time to like read. It was like, as you go in the door, and it was done like a, a radio play. You'd have all the actors there. And I'm sitting next to Frank Welker and Jim Cummings and Rob Paulson and April Winchell and Nancy Cartwright and Dana Hill. And I mean, oh my God, these professionals. And here I was kind of leading the show. And uh, it was uh, a you know, terrifying thing, but uh, you learn from those kind of people. And as Alan was saying, now today, um, it's all kind of solo. You know, I'll do my lines on one day, and Mickey comes in and does his the next day, and then they add it together. So it, you don't really get that back and forth, which is so much fun. You can play off of the other actor. Right now, I got to know if I'm going in, and they say, "Okay, you and Mickey are in a room," and I say, "Come on, Mickey, let's get out of here." I don't know anything about that, so I got to rely on the director or the stage directions and, and the script. Like, okay, oh, the room's on fire. Okay. <laughs> Then it changes your acting. It's like, well, let's get out of here, you know, that kind of thing. Or is Mickey 50 feet away? Hey, Rick, let's get out of here. Or is he right next? Come on, Mick, let's get out of here. You know, it totally, that spatial, you know, thing makes it totally come alive. You've just got to imagine the characters, and then you got to ask, like, oh, how far away is he? What's the situation? And why are you doing this in the first place? Once you get all of that stuff down, then the voice follows it. But, but for these folks, if you could, make an offer you couldn't refuse. We're going to make him an offer he can't refuse. <laughs> All right, uh, black shirt, yellow lander. I think it's yellow. So, Mr. Al uh, Oppenheimer, hello. Uh, huge uh, He-Man fan. So, what was the uh, the process of you getting the getting the role of being on Masters of the Universe? What was the process of you getting the role on Masters of the Universe? The process. Like the process. Mm -hmm. Like how, how were you approaching the world and such? Mm -hmm. Oh well, I, I think I told you about uh, seeing the cell and oh. and the bony head, and then uh, Merman. Well, he was in the water, so I just. Uh, I just gargled and talked at the same time. <laughs> oh my God! You know that's all that is. And, <laughs> stop laughing. <laughs> and then Cringer is just your supreme coward, you know. Oh why not, you know? And then he becomes Battle Cat, and all I did in Battle Cat was, Ugh. and they filled the rest in from stock. I didn't have to tear up my voice any more than the intro to that. Oh, and Man at Arms is just my ordinary Oppenheimer voice. Golden, yes. That's you, sir, on the end? Yeah, uh, Bill. So, what? When it came to getting the role of Scoopy, were you already prepared with this voice, or was it an opportunity to come across? It, uh, I had done the five years of stand-up, and on advice of an agent in Dallas, they said, oh, you do all these voices, you ought to go to Hollywood and stuff. So I got an apartment out here, left my wife in Dallas, and I commuted for about a year. But about five months later, they said, do you do any of the Disney characters? At the time, there were four or five Goofies and four or five Mickeys and stuff, but they weren't doing much on television. But with the advent of the Disney Channel, you heard the same character over and over, and it might be from Walt Disney World, or it might be from Disneyland, might be on an album. Roy Disney, Michael Eisner wanted one voice for each of the main characters, so there was a big audition. I had no idea how 
big it would be. And they said, well, I, and they asked me if I did any of the voices. And I said, well, if you do the falsetto, you can kind of do a Mickey, you know, because that's baby. Gosh, oh boy. You know, it's the way I like that. And I said, I kind of do Mickey. And uh, Goofy was my favorite growing up. So, <laughs> but it wasn't a, a staple that I did all the time. Um, and Donald, I can't, I can go, that's all I can do. Oh, cool. but, uh, <laughs> but so I got a cassette tape of Pinto Colvig, the original voice of uh, Goofy, practiced it over a weekend, went in and laid it down. And then about a month later, they said they'd like to use you as Goofy. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm not a Disney employee. I've never been a Disney employee. We're all independent contractors. I went in for one job. I never knew if I'd get a second job. And I had to loop to a piece of old, an old cartoon. And I said something like, Worse, you put my foot on the brake and I'm out of here fast. And that was for a thing called MTV's Doggone Valentine. And so I did one line. I was terrified. I didn't, I'd never looped to a picture before. And we got through it. And about a month later, they said, we'd like to use you on another one. And it was another one. It was a Halloween one. And I got to work with my first celebrity then. Uh, Gary Owens, who was the open, and I got to do the opening, they had the old NBC Peacock, and Gary would, did the first half, we got to share a microphone, so cool, and he was so nice, and uh, he, he said, the following program is brought to you in living color, and I'd say, on NBC, <laughs> and uh, so I went home, oh, I got You never know if that's going to be your life. They don't say you're now the voice. So it was like years and years. And luckily in 2009, they made me a Disney legend. They gave me an award. So I finally figured I got the job. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of how that happened. Well, folks, I'm afraid to say our time's coming to an end. We've got to close it off here. Uh, be sure you go visit these, these legends at their booths. Big round of applause for Bill Barnes.